And then Susan Orlean, Orlean got into a real panic yesterday. <laughs> A true panic, maybe she won't agree uh, on my assessment, but she wrote to me and said, can it be six words, <laughs> question mark, or less? And I wrote back saying, can it be six words or less? I said, Susan, you have your seven words. <laughs> but um, then two minutes later, I thought, well, Come on, she can, she can, if not do better, at least do something else. So it could be, can it be six words or less, but in fact she has submitted me seven words, and her seven words as we welcome her to this stage is, curiosity killed the cat, but not me. Please welcome her. <laughs> Thank you. Did they believe my autobiography? Well, tell me, is it believable? It's all true. I don't know actually what ha happened to the cat, so. But um, were, you, were you worried doing those seven words? I was. Did you play Paralyzed with, with fear, actually. Really? Why? Well, first of all, I hate writing when I'm not getting paid. <laughs> well, I, I, will, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will take that to the powers that be here and see what we can do. Oh, that says it all, actually. But it's also um, to reduce yourself to seven words is it's either too many words is that why you wanted six? I, I did want six. <laughs> I felt like I had found many ideal descriptions that were six words. And Do you remember one? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> no, one was read, write, rinse, repeat. Read, write, rinse, repeat. Oh, that was four. <laughs> <laughs> so then I thought, well, maybe four would work. And, um, and then I thought, you'll be mad at me if I can't do seven, so, or was it six? No, I can't remember, I just, I knew that there, I was doing it wrong. Um, and, and then I thought, this is important, I feel like... Well, I, I sent you some models. I didn't look at any you of them. You didn't? Um, no. No, I, because I, I usually, there are people who say, you know, how on earth am I going to do that? I said, well, you know, Joan Didion. Um, yeah, that's really yeah. helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Joan Didion, seven words, which you might want to know. She said, uh, seven words do not yet define me. I mean, pretty good. Pretty and yeah. Laurie Anderson's were not bad either, so I thought that maybe under the pressure of those words, you... Yeah, yeah. well, that everyone knows that pressure is so good for producing yeah. great writing. For, yeah. and, um, the, and I had a deadline, you repeatedly reminded I, me I of did. the deadline. Yeah. Noon, noon Wednesday, Susan, it's 10 of noon. Right. What time zone are you in? It's no. almost noon. No, the, 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 the <laughs> Don't, don't let every. I mean, there are many people in this audience who I might want to have on this stage. They will Ooh, never want to. I'm after exaggerating. This. No, no. None of it this was, is true. It was a quarter to noon. But yes. uh, you know, I, I, al I always love repeating the notion. Do you, do you know where the word deadline comes from, which is so interesting? It's prison yeah. language. It's a line whereby which, if you cross it, you're shot. But oh. at any rate, um, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to say something in be at the beginning, which is important. Um, for this evening, which is that um, I'd like to dedicate this evening, and it will become clear at certain moments in this conversation, to someone who was very dear to both of us, and who was really uh, uh, someone I, I, I'd say I consider a friend is Jonathan Demi. And so this evening, I spoke to Joanne today, is for Jonathan Demi, who you worked with. Uh, Right, he was, and actually I realize this is uh, somewhat uh, unknown to many people, which is he is the person who optioned The Orchid Thief and who 
um, turned it over to Sp uh, Spike Jones and Charlie Kaufman, who created Adaptation. And I think much of the time he was sitting there sort of scratching his head, as most of us were, but gave them complete freedom to, to do the movie that they did, which is pretty great. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. this, is, this is for him, and, and um, I'll, I'll be speaking in a moment of a, a moment where actually it's a rare, rare opportunity I had where he actually interviewed me. But I'll tell you about that in a moment because it fits in, I think, quite beautifully with, with the subject at hand, whatever that might be. <laughs> but, um, you know, your seven words reminded me of, of the wonderful words of Dorothy Parker when she said that the cure for boredom is curiosity. There is no cure for curiosity. And I want to begin there because, in a sense, I think that your tactic in life is curiosity. Um, and it reminds me, since I'm by nature a quotomaniac, it reminds me of um, this wonderful historian, Carlo Ginzburg, who said that he approaches his subjects with the euphoria of ignorance. Mm, that's perfect. And he, I remember being in his house in Bologna, and there was a table with seven or eight hundred books, I might be exaggerating, 300 or 400 books. And I said, Carlo, what are you doing? And he said, I'm preparing an article. Wow. Right? <laughs> um, so he had, but he said, I know nothing about the subject. And that's when he said, the euphoria, I approach my subjects with the euphoria of ignorance. So how does this mesh with Susan Orlean? Uh, well, I wish I had said that because now you that's, have. Yeah, I'm going to appropriate it. Yeah, do. I always I'm drawn to things I don't know anything about. My expertise is not being an expert. My expertise actually is being curious. I go into everything I write about as a student. I'm just learning learning, learning, absorbing, doing a crash course in whatever the subject is. And where the writing happens is at the point where I feel that I can go from being a student to being a teacher and then speak to a reader about what I've just learned. I like the fact that, I'm, that I enter things without knowledge. And I don't, I actually don't do all of the prep. And I feel very strongly about this. Um, I w some years ago, I did a story for The New Yorker. I wanted to write a piece about a gospel group traveling in, in the South. And before I went down to travel with this group, a lot of people said to me, oh, have you read this encyclopedia on black gospel music and this one and that one? And I said, well, I don't, I don't want to go down there armed with this book learning. I'm going down to be with the people who are living this and let them teach me. So I enter it as a student being taught by the people who are living in the world that I'm trying to explore. And I feel that that's a more authentic way of... Yeah. of really absorbing a subject. You speak about the authenticity of curiosity, which I think is so interesting. I also think on, on some level, there is a lot of armor that you can come with. Uh, you know, you're a writer for The New Yorker, you're this, you're that. It's a lot of um, armor to approach, especially people who aren't regularly written about. And in adaptation, there's a wonderful moment where Meryl Streep, who plays you, comes and says, you know, I'm a writer for The New Yorker. And he says, yeah, I, kn I know what The New Yorker is. Uh, right. Sort of and actually, one of the great things is I, I love writing uh, about people who don't know what The New Yorker is. I mean, that's a whole world of people who are worth writing about. But I think that there's a humility in that ignorance that I think is really important to, I mean, being a writer is an incredible privilege and it gives you a kind of power that is distinct in this world. It's really valuable to be 
a little humbled by your lack of knowledge and and invigorated by it. I, but some I, people, of course, approach it saying, I have a lack of knowledge, I'm going to find out. You know, it reminds me a little bit because it's, there, there was a time in, in my life where I, I was a pretend scholar and I w worked in academia and I was writing a dissertation and my advisor was getting more and more and more frustrated and one day I uh, had invited him to come and lecture and you know there was always another article to read and procrastination is the other side of perfectionism all of those things were there and he just sat me down and he said you know Paul there are two kinds of dissertations brilliant dissertations and finished dissertations <laughs> Oh my God, well, that's, the, uh, I, I would hate to completely apply that to my own profession because uh, then, uh, well, yeah. if it's a, um, a, a zero choice. sum choice, that yeah. would be sad, but there certainly is a point where you have to say, I Go. know enough, and I think you feel it. It's, it's a gut feeling where you feel that you know enough that you can begin telling the story to people. What, what is that moment? It's a couple of things. One is when you begin to realize that the array of people y you've spoken to are all merging into one, that you know the story of, of this entire web of people. And secondly, when you start hearing some of the same information more than once. Just as a reporter, you think, well, I already I already have learned this, and your learning curve goes from being incredibly steep to flattening out, and that's when I think you know. It, and it's very much a gut feeling, and it doesn't hurt to have a deadline, <laughs> but um, the reality is, I think until you feel that you know enough to, to become the teacher, um, you're not ready. Because I wonder what that moment was with the library book. I mean, there is a moment in the book very early on which seems, uh, maybe maybe it isn't. It, it seems like it could be a moment of epiphany, but it, it may not be. I'll read it very quickly. It, it concerns somebody, actually, we both know um, and other people in this audience also know uh, not long after my son interviewed the librarian, uh, uh, your, your son needed to, he had an assignment. From school, to talk to a city employee, and I, I recommended he speak to a garbage man, and he proposed that he speak to a librarian, um, which I still what think is a very strange, interesting reversal <laughs> of what you would expect. Uh, uh, and very, very telling for you, because well, we'll, we'll speak about the relationship libraries might have had in your childhood with your mother, but it was a, a, a very shrewd uh, choice on his part. So oh. there, yeah. He got so many toys after that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we did go to. You went to, a, to you went to various libraries, and then you you go um, to the Central Library, right. to the Los Angeles Public Library, which. For those of you who don't know, Los Angeles is insofar that there is a center in Los Angeles. It's somewhere around there. Um, I remember when I was a jolly good fellow at the Getty many years ago, the, the, the Europeans always said, but, but dove c'è il centro? Where is the center? And I kept telling them it's somewhere in the middle of the ocean because it just is, <laughs> there is no center. But the Los Angeles Public Library somehow it feels, it it's downtown. Yes. So, uh, so there you are, not long after my son interviewed the librarian, I happened to meet a man named Ken Brecker who runs the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, the non-profit organization that champions the city's libraries and raises money for extra programming and services. Brecker offered to give me a tour of the Central Library, so a few days later I drove downtown to meet him. From the highway I could see the quiver of dark skyscrapers in the center of the city that surrounded the library. The summer and fall had been rainless, the landscape around me was bright and bleached, blasted with an almost ashy pallor. Even the palm trees seemed sapped of color and the reddish rooftops were whitened as if dusted with sugar. 
I felt new here, who had moved from the East Coast, and the sheer breath of Los Angeles still astonished me. It seemed like I could drive and drive and drive, and the city could just keep unfurling almost if it, as if it were a map of Los Angeles being unrolled as I drove over it, rather than a real city that started and stopped somewhere specific. And now we get to it. In Los Angeles, your eyes keep is this right? Am I great here? No. Is this not the... <laughs> no. No, I, I, I wanted to, to get to the... the we finally made our way to the fiction department and stopped near the first row of shelves. Brecker took a break from his commentary and reached for one of the books, cracked it open, held it up to his face, and inhaled it deeply. I had never seen someone smell a book quite like that before. Brecker inhaled the book a few more times, then clapped it, clapped it, yeah, clapped it shut and placed it back on the shelf. You can still smell the smoke in some of them, he said almost to himself. I wasn't quite sure what he meant, so I tried this. They smell like smoke because the library used to let patrons smoke. <laughs> no, Brecker said. Smoke from the fire. The fire. The fire. The fire. What fire? The fire, he said. The big fire. The one that shut the library down. And the next paragraph begins on April 29th, 1986. So, was that the moment? Absolutely. I, I had spent a certain amount of time when I had taken my son to interview the librarian and I walked into that library, I had a profound sort of Proustian moment of feeling that I had been shot out of a cannon backward in time to my own chi childhood of going to the library with my mother and it was such a powerful memory, and everything about the library felt exactly the same. The smell, the sound, everything. And I began thinking, why does this feel so potent? I went to many places with my mother. Why, what is it about a library that seems almost like a living thing, rather than a building with walls and shelves and books. It felt like it had some human vitality and certainly an emotional vitality that was unlike anything I could think of. So I had it in my head that I wanted to understand why a place could have so much power and so much emotion. But I, I wasn't sure what the narrative would be. But it just was in my head that this was something I wanted to write about. And you told, uh, you told your editor at one point, or your publisher, I want to spend a year in a library. And the reaction was, Nice. Hmm, nice. Um, you know, there's a wonderful and moment in adaptation when uh, Charlie's agent says, yeah, I know, it's this sprawling New Yorker shit. And I thought, oh my God, I'm a I'm a cliche. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to write another one of these sprawling New Yorker stories. But it still struck me that there was something very f it just something fascinating. Something didn't let you go. And yeah, it just kept coming back to me. When Ken said the fire, first of all, you say the word library and fire in one sentence, and it's galvanizing. Secondly, when I learned a little bit more in the scope of the fire, I thought, how did I not know about this? How this was the know? largest single library fire in the history of the United States. Just, just mention the numbers. 400,000 books destroyed, 700,000 damaged. And the library was shut for almost seven years and after the fire. It burned for six hours and 12 it minutes, so I can't it remember was, this. Uh, yes, it burned for over seven hours, seven and hours. the temperature reached 2,500 degrees, so that not only were the books burning, the shelves melted. It was a 
furious fire. Um, there was a point when the fire department wasn't sure that they could save the building. And you go into detail <coughs> about, you know, the, the, I mean, truly an interesting form of research. At, at what temperature do things burn perfectly? There's a word for it, yes. which I'm forgetting. It's so stoichiometric you condition you. where you. you have, you know, ask me anything about arson. I, I'm available. And very and, and <laughs> arsonists, it's interesting because they're very so seldomly indicted. Yes, and I mean that was um, I. I'm not. Uh, it wasn't me. I just want to <laughs> make that perfectly clear. All right. Um, but it it was uh, incredibly furious <coughs> fire that was also very difficult to put out because. The stacks in the LA library were built in this very traditional way of being essentially gi giant chimneys lined with books. And it was a, a fire trap. Also, uh, interestingly, up until 1986, the American Library Association recommended against sprinkler systems because the feeling was that water, water was, worse. was worse than than fire and they had just changed their position on that but the I LA mean library moments before yeah uh, they yeah. were just then looking into how they could put in some sort of sprinkler they didn't have fire doors they didn't have any any fire suppression and the building was built to house a million books and it had 2 million books so you had books everywhere stuffed into corners and out, under out shelves. And out of order. Yes. Which means that when they burnt, a lot of a lot of people didn't know which books burnt, which is a detail in the book, but it's haunting. It's so it if you don't order things perfectly, when they burn, you're not sure that they... You don't know what you've yeah, lost. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it was a kind of... It was a sort of haunting realization. So this fire absolutely blew through the building, was an enormous catastrophe for the library. And partly I thought, why did I not know about this? This is, uh, I can't imagine. I was living in New York, but I thought, I can't imagine why I didn't hear about this. So and you, I and went. You found out. I why. did, and, and it was. And, and, and it's one story outdid the other. It was. Uh, I went to look at the New York Times from that day, and the headline, and I'm paraphrasing badly, was Soviets deny nuclear accident at Chernobyl. And honestly, reading that made me even more determined to do this book because it just felt like all of these things were aligning. This strange, this horrible fire having been pushed out of the news because of this international crisis. The fact that the numbers of books destroyed was so overwhelming and, you know, my feeling of why is the thought of a library burning so horrible? kind of return me to that same question I had. And, and the story also, Chernobyl and the library, is something there. About the... About both disasters. Yes, and the, the sort of the confluence control of, yeah. of, in fact, this notion that the, f the, the power of, of something being unleashed and how frightening it, it was. So at how that frightening point, it could be. And, and certainly, the both cases, the, the worst case scenario, proved to be what happened. Then when I heard it was an arson, I thought, well, I'm all in. This is, <laughs> this this is, is just too This is too exciting. My <laughs> curiosity is just peaked yes, completely. Exactly. I am a cat. Uh, yes, exactly. And I think that combination of the emotional story and, and the sense of why do libraries mean so much to us, coupled with this really dramatic story. How did the library get rebuilt? What, who did it? Um, and why did they do it? And all of that combined made me feel that I had just kind of stumbled into something really 
utterly fascinating and irresistible. Yeah, so so the, the, the question I had for you, which in a way you, you, you have started to answer, but you, you say that um, in, in the afterword of the Orchid Thief, you, you write that this is a book about an idea, the pursuit of a passion. P word passion you use quite often, and it's a word I feel so terribly close to. I, I don't know if you know this wonderful German romantic writer, uh, Lessig, who wrote, who said that all passions are pleasant. Hmm. Even as unpleasant, they remain pleasant. Um, th 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 there's something about uh, th you, you uh, the exact quotation is all passions, even unpleasant, are as passions pleasant. So that's better phrased. So you were pursuing an idea, a passion. Mm -hmm. And what is it here? What is, there is an idea, I mean, yes, I mean, people have asked me, what is this book? And yeah, it's, it's about the burning of a library. Not Alexandria, another library, very recently. We don't know about it, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, probably in Los Angeles people know about it more, but still it isn't a very known fact. Right. And, um, and it didn't just get submerged because of Chernobyl. It, there may be other reasons why it didn't make the news in the way that some things make the news. But what is the idea um, behind this? I mean, is there one? I, yes. I think that um, part of what I was pursuing was to understand what was the idea that animated me. And brought all of the threads of this story together. Because there's also another story within it, which is um, remembering my mother and remembering those trips that we had spent together. And my mother was diagnosed with dementia soon after I began work on the book. And <coughs> her memory vanished. Her memory, but her me memory remained at the very beginning. She was proud of the fact that, mm -hmm. I, I love the way you, you talk about that. I mean, it's Well, like all mothers, she took credit for the book. <laughs> <laughs> she took credit, she but at the, what I meant to say in terms of her a a increasing ailment and illness, at the beginning, she realized that you were writing about... Yes, But yes. then it quickly... And I was really, it meant a lot to me that she knew that I was writing about the library because it was, she, she knew how special those trips were and how that was something we shared very distinctly. Describe one of those visits. We would go a couple of times a week and the we would go to the little branch library Which near one? my house, the Bertram Woods Branch Library. Yeah, wonderful in, pages in about it. It's uh, just a very classic um, branch library in a suburb of Cleveland where I grew up. And we would come into the library together. And even when I was very young, how, how she young? would, I, I think we started going when I was about four on these kinds of trips. And I would be allowed to go off on my own. And I think part of why I loved it so much was that it was probably the only place when I was that age where I was allowed to wander off on my own. It was also one of the few places where I could have anything I wanted. I also that, I think... That is true. I mean, it's incredibly oh, it important. Was, it was... Uh, I mean, when you're a kid and you're used to being told, no, you get to pick one, this was... Take them all. <laughs> and to leave with things that I hadn't paid for was very <laughs> exciting to me. And I loved to read, so it wasn't merely that I was uh, enjoyed acquiring the books. I loved reading, and I would blow through these books as fast as I could, and we'd go back again. And, and how many did you take? Well, there probably was a limit, but I remember taking five or six at a time, and then Going, I would read any time I could, and what I would. Was, what was some I would of the sleep first? With my books. What was some of the first? Well, I was kind of into horses. 
um, big shock, I know, a girl reading books about horses. But um, I was, you know, anything that had horses or animals, I was generally interested in animals. But the Misty of Shinko Teague and Black Beauty and all of the horse literature, <laughs> as I would like to put it. Um, and I would just... But not paying was terribly important. Oh, it was so yeah. exciting. And the sense that that it, that freedom was intoxicating. You know, for me, the experience of libraries was t terribly important. But one other experience I had, which I love, when I think back at it, I grew up, if in so far that I did, I grew up in, in Belgium. And there was something called La Discothèque Nationale, where you would go and you could rent records, which of course you can do now in, in, in uh, libraries. And you could rent 10 and somehow I got very friendly with the librarian and she let me rent 20. And um, so I could have, you know, seven versions of the magic flute instead of only three. <laughs> and what you had to do there, which was so fantastic, is every six months you had to bring your stylus in. It was a date. To be checked? And somebody would oh look in a micro, you know, microscope to look at your stylus. And that was the only exchange. Except for that, you had, you know, you had thousands and thousands of records you could discover. And I remember feeling that sense of just incredible freedom. Anything yeah. is available. Well, so that it sense of such bounty. As yeah. So it just that, that plenty. And it was such a thrill. And my parents were readers, but they weren't book buyers. They right. were... And something happens in your life, which I, I, I love that moment. I love the moment when you rebel and you uh. go from being a, um, someone who borrows books to someone who buys them. It was... And you uh, talk about it with <laughs> such pleasure. I'm now going to possess. Yeah, I, I think it was about the time that I got my first apartment and I just wanted to have books. I wanted every surface lined with books. And this became a source of some friction between me and my parents. I mean, it may have been rebelling against this feeling of, uh, why can't we own books? Why do we have to go to the library to get them? And when I would go home and my mother would tell me about some book she was interested in and she'd say, well, it's, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I have it on hold at the library. And I would say, well, just go buy it. And she would say, oh, Susie, you know, that's foolish. You know, you can get it from the library. It was, so I think I was responding to their, I mean, you know, you reach a certain age where everything your parents do is wrong and so that seemed very wrong to me so um, what so what is the difference you mean now no or um, between owning a book and borrowing a book yeah well i liked the like, you know it's funny it reminds me of that period of time when I would go out with guys and I would always sneak over to look at their books and their record collection and use it as a measure of whether they were somebody I actually wanted to go out with or not. Um, you're it was you're sort not, of a you're way not the only one. You know the John Waters line, if you go back to somebody's home and they don't have books, don't fuck them. Oh, yeah. well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I remember asking Wolfgang Tillmans, who was here at the library, that question that John Waters had asked him about art, and his response was, no, no, it isn't really about, about whether they have good or bad, whether they have art, it's whether it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. And bad art was really not inspiring for him. Well, I think that it was a period in my life where it was important to me to kind of display who I was, and my books, were a display of my taste and my interests. And, and it felt it like um, this aesthetic that I wanted to be part of. I also think that um, it was an extension of 
having my own place for the first time and feeling like I wanted it to be the way I wanted it to be and not the way my parents' house looked. But the book, the, the having of it, well, it's a, it it's a, a, a difference. I think uh, at that... Um, then and now, maybe, I should ask. Um, so you rebelled against your parents. I think possibly in a, in a, in a way that, that may have been qualitatively good for your experience as a reader, or maybe not. Yes. I think also at that time in my life, more than now, I was a great rereader of books. And I wanted a book... I wanted to be able to mark it up. I wanted to read it and then read it again. And I don't reread books now. I think the luxury of time to read is when you're in college and you have nothing but time meant that I would read something and it was so profound and um, life-changing that I would immediately read it again. And it mattered to own it and have it there as m this token of the experience I had had reading it. And then and I would revisit it several times. And it was my copy. It felt very particular, even when they were crummy, cheap paperbacks. You know, there's this wonderful line in Proust where he says that the first edition of a book is the first edition in which you've read it. Mm -hmm. So it's not, r so w that it's crummy doesn't, Matter, yeah, really. and it's a lot of those yeah. books were the cheap paperback editions that, um, y you know, you get at a college bookstore. Where are they now? Well, some of them have fallen apart, and uh, even though it pained me deeply, I've replaced them. But many of them um, I still have, and they s smell, and they're horrible, <laughs> and, and the type is this big, but and I... Do you feel possessed by your possessions in that way? Uh, yes, I am um, a little bit of a materialist, if that's what you're asking. And well, no, that's what you're answering. Yeah. Um, yeah <laughs> no, 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 I'm not asking. Well, I, this brings us back to yeah. the fact that even a l horrible, banged up, foxed and crusty edition of a book that I've had forever. And I would think, I can go buy a nice new one, so I'll just throw this one out, because it wasn't even good enough to donate. And I would hold it and bring it over to a, a wastebasket and sort of <laughs> linger over it and then take it back and think, I, ca I can't, I can't. And that emotion and that feeling about books feeling like they have a soul in some way that you can't quite throw it out even if it, you're doing it a favor. Um, or yourself. I, yeah, and uh, you know, I have the copy of Ulysses that I read in college that I'm serious, the type is this big. I couldn't read it if I wanted to. It smells, it's Do horrible. It's, I got a new one. I got, yeah. and uh, I have two now. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and do you... D well, you they sit next to each other. They keep each other company <laughs> on the bookshelf. And, but it, I think that that was uh, so much of what really kept coming back to me in the course of working on this, that a library and books are animated in some way that's very special, that's you know, very I distinct. I love that gesture you did. Um, of dangling my yeah, book over the wastebasket. Because it's a gesture that you then enact um, in a very different way. Um, and you have some incredible pages about this where you, I think like a, a really good reporter, you just say, you know, I'm going to burn a book. I'm just going to see what it feels like. And you explain just how hard it is in some way. It was 
remarkably hard. I mean, sometimes you think something's going to be hard, and then you think, oh, come on, it's not that big a deal. Maybe I'm exaggerating. But I made the decision to burn a book in part to confront this taboo that I felt so strongly and a sort of curiosity about, you know, I'd written so much about this library burning, but I, I've never seen a book burn. So I had to choose which book to burn. So you had all of your books. I was looking at all my books and I thought, I'll burn a book I don't like. And then I thought, that seems so wrong. I, I just can't do that. So I thought, well, I'll burn a book I like. And I thought, but I don't want to do that. I, 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 I don't want to burn a book I like. For a very brief moment, I thought, I'll burn one of my books. And then I thought, that's awful. I can't, <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. And I was really stuck, and then I thought, I'm just not going to do this. It feels, it's too uncomfortable. Even, in, even though I'm giving myself permission to do this, it felt so uncomfortable. And I said to my husband, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this, never mind. And I really put it out of my head. And then one day he walked in with this big grin on his face and handed me a book and said, I've got the right one for you to burn. And it was Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> <laughs> and it was indeed the right book to burn. Um, but it was still a incredibly strange feeling that I was doing something really wrong. And, you know, I'm perfectly happy to, like, take an ax and chop up a chair or... I mean, I'm not against destroying things. I'm not squeamish about throwing things out or, you know, I mean, there are limits. But I, I really found it amazing how much I resisted doing this, even though I had said, well, I'm doing it for my book. I, it's research it's and research. development, yeah. It's not that I'm enjoying it. It's that I, I want to do this for the... For the purposes of experiencing this. And then finally what um, compelled me was thinking, I bet Ray Bradbury would feel this was okay, so I'm going to do it. We'll get back to him in a moment, um, because he's so much part of, of any story that has to do with books and burning. I mean, many, many books have stories about books and burning, but his in particular is interesting. I'd like us to, so that you can actually visualize just how dramatic this burning of the library was, show you some images of the Los Angeles Public Library burning. So if we could look at images four to six, please. I think it's right there on your screen. And it's a, a really beautiful building, um, built in the 1920s, very uh, sort of fantastical and quite wonderful. The inside is, is really beautiful. The walls are thick, thick concrete, so the fire just got hotter and hotter because the walls wouldn't yield. In a way, the, the strength of the building was almost a liability, and this picture is pretty Amazing, awful. Amazing, huh? Yeah. What's amazing is some of those books on the left that you see that look reasonably unharmed, um, the books that were, I'm sure they were full of smoke and may have also gotten wet. So all of those 700,000 books that were damaged were put in um, food freezers That's for about six story, years. Yeah, yeah it's, it was the largest book recovery effort ever made. And what's incredible taken, taken is... Taken to restaurants and... Yeah, they all were all, yeah. stored next to broccoli. Um, so the, these are some... Oof, that, that, look, that hurts to look at these. Then um, w what is amazing and sort of heartening is that a really a considerable percentage 
of the ones that were frozen and then eventually thawed and dried were able to be returned to the shelves. Because if you don't freeze them, what happens? You Within you become 48 this hours, they mold. And if they're molded, then the they are, are ruined. So they so that had explains to find the sprinkler problem. That yes. explains yeah, the whole notion that mold is worse than nearly anything. And and water is so damaging. Any book that has um, glossy pages, if it gets wet at all, it's ruined. Those, all of those books, all the art books, any book with that kind of paper stock, those were all ruined. But this, I find, it's it's tremendous. It, it so. W w when you use the word, it's painful. What? Tell tell me about that pain. Well, it, this is horrible to say, but it almost looks like skin. It looks like a, a human skin that's it been look, to me. It looks burned. also like you know the 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 artist Anselm Kiefer, who does work of that. Yeah, kind. and the and paints a lot of war scenes that are really um, disturbing. It's. I think it's uncomfortable to look at something like a book burned like that. And the library, th this, these are photos that were sent to me by the Los Angeles Public Library. The, they are every day they are, they are posting different images of, of these books. It's an interesting way of paying tribute. Well, what's interesting, and this was a sheer coincidence and serendipity, is that it was exactly 25 years ago when the library reopened after being closed for those seven years. And during that time, they reopened a, a very small um, sort of temporary downtown branch. But the books, most of the books were in storage, and certainly all the damaged books were in storage, but they, they didn't have space to have their collection available. They restored the building, they did fundraising to, I mean, this is a yeah. shocking fact, but the insurance that they had covered the building, but it didn't cover the contents. So the replacement, uh, and of course, some of those books couldn't be replaced. But to rebuild a collection had to, the money had to be raised from um, sources both large and small, and they managed to do it. And what's also extraordinary in the book is how you describe the fires happening and thousands of volunteers come to and help. And it's such a, a community effort in a human chain, as you say, of people, you know, taking this book and handing it to someone else un until the 17th person is actually putting it on a truck where it will end up going into a refrigerator. And to me, th th that was very striking for two reasons. One is that I was new to Los Angeles and I was laboring under the notion that there was no sense of community or, or connection in Los Angeles. But you, you know better now. Now, at, certainly, and this was uh, within hours of the fire. They had 2,000 people down there offering to help. But secondly, the image of people passing a book from hand to hand to save it struck me as being what libraries are, mm. that we pass these books, these stories from generation to generation, from one person to the next, and to save them. It, that image and the idea of saving memories yeah, resonated I, I, for me throughout, throughout the book. I remember we, we, we spoke about that once, this wonderful line of an African saying that when an old person dies, a library disappears with them. And to me, that is what the book's about. R ah. This, this, uh, the, the connection between the human experience and the experience that we have through books. That they are, we are each a library of... Stories. Stories and knowledge and feelings and memories. So, and the, the library replicates that on the level of the community as a whole. This is, this is our 
library of memories and information and thoughts and fantasies. And maybe that's partly why it feels so human, because it's, it's I mean, libraries are more organized than, than most human brains. <laughs> but otherwise, I began seeing them as this communal brain, this... Communal brain and also the notion that they, I mean, they're becoming more and more so, but they still are one place of resistance towards commodification. <laughs> and so that they are not so far removed from commodification as one would wish, mm -hmm. but they are still one step removed. So the, the drudgery of being useful, the drudgery of, of, of cost, of, you know, that there's a movie now that's come out of Nathaniel Kahn on, on the art world and, um, and, and money, and it's called The Price of Everything, and takes mm -hmm. a title from Oscar Wilde, everybody knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. Mm -hmm. And there is there, here, I mean, what you're talking about is there is still an intrinsic value. And, and in Books are different from any <coughs> other object, nearly. Yes. Perhaps. And the fact that we've chosen to make them available, we've placed a value on them that's that says, yes, if you want to own a book, and I, every time I say this, I feel like I'm cutting into my own sales. So <laughs> don't listen to me. Um, you do want to own this book. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I highly recommend it. It has some fantastic um, blurbs. I, I, uh, I for agree. instance, there's there one here <laughs> that says, of course, I will always read anything that Susan Orlean writes, and I would encourage you to do the same, regardless of the topic, because she's always brilliant. But the library book is a particularly beautiful and soul-expanding book, even by Orleanian standards. You're going to hear a lot about how important this story is for shining a spotlight on libraries and the heroic people who run them. That's all true, but there's an even better reason to read it, because it will keep you spellbound from the first page to the last. Don't miss out on this one, people. <laughs> Well, that was Elizabeth Gilbert, but I, I, I think so. So do get that one. But now let's yeah, let's but other talk. Than that, now let's <laughs> talk about how horrible commodification is. Yeah, well, I, and I think that uh, there was a, a sort of famous uh, and and much uh, attacked um, editorial not long ago. I think it was in Forbes, if I'm yes. not mistaken, um, suggesting that we don't need libraries and they should be just turned into um, Amazon outlets. And I think it misses the point so completely that... But thankfully it was recognized because so many things so miss the so point. So much so that they took it yeah, off their yeah, website, I, I believe. But I so mean, many things miss the point and continue to be yeah. spoken about. What an amazing thing. I mean, it would be a little bit like saying, a lot of people have backyards, we don't need public parks anymore. I mean, there's a fundamental value in sharing as a community. A public space. Yes, and libraries... And so the book is also about public space and spaces of conviviality. And those are so... Few and far between. So few and so valuable. And I happen to think are we are beginning to appreciate them more and more as so many more people aren't working... They're working from home. And, and one of the things that you talk about, which is very moving and which is certainly true about the, the New York Public Library, but also even more true, uh, truer, not more true, truer, about the LA Public Library is that it is a place that is also a shelter. Uh, it's a shelter for people. So the institution is vulnerable on the one hand, and there's great vulnerability in what it owns mm -hmm. and what it possesses, and it can burn very quickly, and it can become very fragile, and it can, all of the things we've touched upon a little bit, but also the people who S use it as a safe space are very right. often vulnerable. Um, so there's a very large, probably the largest community of homeless people in Los Angeles, and they use the library as a place where they can feel protected. 
It's also interesting because a library becomes one of the few places when, where we encounter a range of people and are reminded, in a sense, of what our community contains. And it's certainly a huge challenge for libraries to, to grapple with some of the issues of homeless people using the library. It's not, I, I, I'm not being naive or uh, oblivious to the fact that it's a huge challenge. It doesn't come without issue. And it was really interesting to me to see how the library accepted that as part of its identity, that this was a place that anybody was welcome. And it was very funny. There were some com people were complaining. There was a story on the news in LA about drug use in the library. And in fact, none of it was in the library. It was all outside. But it, that was only one of the things that was wrong with the report. But people... Uh, the library is entirely porous to society, and there is no problem in society that can't find its way in the library. Uh, and that is part of why they are what they are. They allow society to filter in, and you can't have them be what they are without them being open. It's part of what makes them so distinct. And you certainly can have a subscription library that's uh, not open to everybody, and there, there's a great role that those can play. But I think it would be awful to think that we can't, as a society, say that we have certain places that are available to everybody. And that are truly in the public, for the public good and are available in in every way to everyone. And that's, uh, there and the aren't that many places and, and like that. And we'll come to some of what I would call the remarkable, because the, the book is not about one thing. It certainly isn't about a fire alone. It isn't right. about the person who committed the fire, who I'd like you to talk about. It, but it's about a number of people, including some of the most heroic people, some of the librarians who are... I mean, I, I must say, working in this organization now for over a decade, um, I, I often feel that some of the curators are the true treasures of the library. Oh, they, you know, yes. they walk home every night, and uh, what what they what they do and what they know is so valuable. And when they yeah. when they leave and are not replaced very often, the, a whole knowledge, a, a, a world disappears, like that yeah. African saying. A whole world is gone and irretrievable, despite right. Google. I mean, it's, it's irretrievable. It's yes. gone. And uh, I think that part of the pleasure of doing this book is I love looking at something that seems very simple and ordinary. And then when I think about it, I think, Actually, I have no idea how this works, S right. and that Again, was... Again, the ignorance that is a pleasure. And, and to me, it's thrilling to think, well, how does this work? I mean, how do they get those books on the shelf, and who decides what to and get? And, and, and this, this evening, you saw how the books get to people. Oh, I, I love well, that. Did the, you like the, those the little, little trains uh, that are running I, I, underneath us? I loved us. your reaction to it, which made me feel like you, you're about... Five. <laughs> uh, you said, "Can I have one?" <laughs> you, you really wanted one of those. Oh, they're yeah. amazing! They're like these little uh, cars that are well, automated yeah. that run around with books, and then they dump the books. It's it's adorable. Let, <laughs> let, let, let me let, let me see what I can do. Yeah, but, I'd um, be very happy. But so so we're talking about vulnerability. We're talking about fragility and also resilience. And I'd like us to talk now about something else, which is. A, a mixture of vulnerability, resilience, but also a mixture of hope. And I'm going to show you some images that, to me, are tremendously powerful. Actually, when I, um, well, I won't tell that story. Let's, let's, um, I'll keep that story. Other people here have heard it, and it might not be the right place to tell it. But anyway, let's look at image number three. No, image number one, sorry. 
image number one. Uh, I, I heard the uh, audience go, hmm. So what? This is in London, yes. correct, and during the Blitz. Yeah. And what I love is the fact that some of these guys look like they're just at the library. <laughs> 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 it's not, for, you know, the fact the roof is caved in, the place is on fire. The, their, and bowler, they're just their bowler hats are perfectly yeah, placed. And actually, this is very funny. During the Blitz, um, and there were many libraries that were lost during the Blitz, but the ones that were not harmed remained open and, you know, continued charging overdue fines. And <laughs> it was business as usual in spite of the fact that, you know, half of the libraries in London had been shut down. But th it's a, a terrifying image. It is one of the sections of the book that I found both fascinating and, and nauseating was the the destruction of libraries throughout history. And World War II was the single most devastating period for libraries in the history of the world. The number of books destroyed is just unimaginable. I, I can't remember now. But I can't recall. I can't remember, but, but it is. It's, it's millions and millions, millions and millions. And libraries were targeted by the Nazis in particular, who had a, a squad called the Bren Commandos. And what they did was specifically look for libraries and burn them down for no reason other than to terrify people. Because there's no real strategic y value. You quote George Orwell saying, book burning is the most characteristic Nazi activity. And it, yeah. it was meant to also say you don't exist because these books that were being focused on were by Jewish writers, by homosexual writers, by communist writers, but they were simply burning libraries when they would take, um, invade a country, burn them down. And the message is you don't exist, your history doesn't exist. It occurred to me after I wrote the book that I doubt that there's been a regime in history that has burned books that didn't at some point slaughter people. Because to me, the connection is so direct. And there were a lot of libraries that were destroyed during the war because they were in city centers and they unfortunately were in the path of bombing. Can we, can we look at image number seven just At quickly. some point, um, apparently, more than half the books in Germany uh, in public libraries were destroyed. Half of all of the books in German libraries. So this means, I think, where they burn Wo men. Man Bücher I'm verbrennt, faking it. Verbrennt man auch am Ende <laughs> um, um, which means? Um, it's amazing how I suddenly learned German. I think it's, it's where, where we burn books, where, where they burn books, they next burn men. Wherever they burn books, they will also, in the end, burn human beings. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that there was a purpose, especially with the Jewish population, which, you know, Jews have a very emotional connection to books and define themselves as people of the book and they they, if a Torah is um, in bad shape, they have a funeral for it and bury it. Might be a little extreme, but um, it's, I think there was a, ver a purpose that Nazis had, which was to make that point so evident that this you is, don't exist. This is exist. what is so interesting about this, I might mention, is that it's 1821. Of course, that uh, we had had many centuries of book burnings before World War II. But he's also saying that burning books is a precursor. Yes. It, it, it leads the way to um, a future Holocaust in the yeah. literal sense of the word Holocaust. There were book burnings in the Spanish, in fact, the Spanish Inquisition was one of the first times that they were done as a public, like a party, 
bring bring a book to burn and where it was so specifically meant to say these people who did these writings don't exist and we're burning their books but books have been burned really ever since libraries have been built let's let's go back to the, the those images um one to three i think one and then a, a rendition of one might say of that image this is so wonderful and i think we have the uh we do have the artist the artist in we in the, the house as we they do. say so that's myra kalman who's sitting in the and this which um is the page on which this um this drawing resides and it's it's part 6 um of 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 the principles of uncertainty which is great i was so uncertain but here we have it uh, <laughs> um and it's called courage flowers this is a painting of a photo taken in london in 1940 it's a library that was bombed in the blitz and then the all clear sounded and people returned hope undiminished they returned so elegant and purposeful to the books in capital letters what does this have to do with bobby pins and radiators and koshniks kokoshniks one thing leads to another um hope hope why hope it seems to me that books and libraries imply the persistence of memory and of experience and of knowledge that they they convey to us the idea that everything we strive for can matter beyond our own life that they can continue on even when we're no longer here and that here. life can continue at this moment i remember churchill was asked when when london was bombed he was asked if one shouldn't close the british library he said for goodness sake no this is why we're fighting and it's interesting because libraries are so often when there's any sort of crisis they become the center for um information for shelter if necessary i mean they they represent a place that we all can gather if you think about it there i guess schools may serve that purpose too do you too, remember after 911 was one of the days where the day after 911 on september 12th and 13th were two days where the metropolitan museum had one of its highest attendance yeah we crave public places that we can share you know after decades of of i think people turning inward and turning away from shared space i look at the success of starbucks not that that's such a sort of poetic thing to look at but you could make coffee at home uh, there's a reason you don't uh, there's a kind of sense of community that you enjoy you go out and get a cup of coffee and it's the third place as they say it's not work it's not home it's this other place libraries um really represent that and in a, a world where people increasingly are working at homes so they don't even have that second place of an office you you mentioned some librarian i thought i had it in my notes who really enjoyed more than anything the face to face encounter and the fact yes he was a a, a librarian in the teen department right and he, and he felt that the most important thing was looking at yeah and actually i think it's very interesting that in an age of google and search engines people still call the library all the time to get questions answered 
And sometimes the librarians even think, like, why are you calling me? You let, can let, Google let, this. Let, let's look at images 8, 9, 10, and 11. This, is, they, this is before the age of Google. Why do 18th century English paintings have so many squirrels in them? <laughs> and how did they tame them so that they wouldn't bite the painter? So these are questions that were called in? Called in tent, uh, on the uh, October... Were they called in here or they in were, LA? These, oh, okay. these, this is Ask NYPL. Yeah. Um, let, now, let's may, that may, I mean, this was before the internet, but that would be a hard thing to Google. <laughs> what kind of an apple did Eve eat? <laughs> Telephone request uh, NB92856. <laughs> Are Plato, Aristotle, <laughs> and Socrates one and the same <laughs> person? Telephone question November 24th, 1950. I suppose J.E. was either the person calling or the person taking the request. <laughs> I love these. Is there a full moon every night in Acapulco? <laughs> and I, I included some of these questions because uh, I, I found the logs that the um, Southern California Answering Network, which is what the L.A. Library called their um, reference desk, they kept track of them, and some of them are... First of all, you can't imagine how anyone ever had that question. I don't know if you oh, want, to, want sure. to read them. Um, this was, I had one list, which is in 1937. This was a list um, of what callers were asking, which included what Romeo looked like, amount of milk produced in the U.S. in 1929, Negro slave writings of literary value, statistics on the sterilization of human beings, number of radios in Los Angeles, type of work done in institutions for the feeble-minded, number of Jewish families in Glendale, burial customs in Hawaii, average length of human life, and my favorite, whether immortality can be perceived in the iris of the eye. <laughs> So, you know... Call your local library. <laughs> call your local library and you might find out. Now, um, I don't know if you're, if you're aware, I'm sure you're aware, it's the wrong way of phrasing my question, but while you were writing for some years the library book, for some time, a very famed filmmaker, Fred Wiseman, right. was in this library for, I think, the better part of a year, it might be less, mm -hmm. um, doing a, making one of his extraordinary documentaries called Ex Libris. I have you seen it? No, and in fact, I had heard about it while I was in the middle of writing the book, and I made the decision to wait and see it when I was done so that, that I wouldn't feel For very much the conflicted. reasons you were mentioning. Yeah, and... and Similarly, I didn't read anything that I thought would fall too closely in what I was doing. Well, Fred, Fred, spe Fred Wiseman spent a better part of a year here, probably went to every, I mean, if you know how many staff meetings there are here, he went to many of them. Um, and he filmed the staff meetings with the permission of the powers that be. He came also to many of the public events mm. when I interviewed Edmund de Waal or Patti Smith or Elvis Costello. I never saw him or nearly never saw him. So he had mm. this extraordinary ability, though he has very, very large ears, if I might say so. Mm. He had, uh, so he hears very well, I suppose, but he had the ability to be nearly invisible. And That's a great and quality. Yes, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm mentioning this all because, in a way, his work is not dissimilar. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he embeds himself the way you were talking about yeah. embedding yourself. I'd like us to look at the very beginning. That oh, it's so great. don't don't worry. Well, now you I feel that now I you can, can see it. You can. I, I authorize you to see it, <laughs> and it's three it's three hours and eighteen minutes. I can't wait. Yeah. Well, you'll... Are we going to see the whole thing now? <laughs> um, we are. So if we could look at... Yeah. Good morning. Thanks for calling Ask My PL. How can I help? 
Oh, the Gutenberg Bible is temporarily unavailable for viewing. I see you've got one book on hold called Working with Bereavement. I believe that the issue is that you are very close to the limit of 50. Yes, uh, we still do have old books showing coats of arms from Europe and things like that. So, let me go through the list again. You have, is, there all, is that all there is? Washington, D.C., Plants of Power, The Meaning of Life, The Marriage Benefit, Between Panic and Desire. Okay, it's about the, the geography and geology of New York City back in the, in the earliest before the, before the Dutch arrival, okay, in the early 17th century. So you can return your books to any branch in Manhattan, the Bronx, or Staten Island. You cannot, you cannot return your material to Brooklyn or Queens. A unicorn uh, is actually an imaginary animal, okay? <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not a creature that ever existed. No, I don't speak Spanish. You need someone who speaks Spanish? Hold on. The first appearance I have of it is in the year 1225, okay? And it's got uh, the opinion of one uh, ancient uh, monk that um, I'll sort of have to translate this from Middle English, which uh, I'm a little poor in, uh, but he's sort of saying that man is a wolf on the outside, but inside himself, he's a unicorn. And they spell it with an E. Great. That's, I can't wait to see it. I love sitting with the reference librarians and also at the circulation desk because I love the complete randomness of what people think about and what people want to read. And it filled me with this sort of joy of, of realizing that human beings are so utterly unpredictable and have such wild range of interests and curiosity and issues that they want the library to solve. And um, it just thrilled me. Uh, it, I would sit and, there and, and see a book and... And, and, and in a way, it's, it's another way of talking about hope. To me, it was this sense... Well, first of all, I would see a book that I couldn't believe anyone had ever written the book. And that someone was checking it out. I thought... <laughs> That's so wonderful that someone wrote this weird book. Give me an example. Um, there must be one that... I'm trying to think of... Nothing instantly comes to mind, but some strange, super rarefied topic. And there was someone who was so happy that they had found this book and they were going to take it home and read it. And it was like, peop you know, those misconnection ads and the back of the village voice, you think they found each other. The, the now they, you know, the, the, this the, the, one writer and this one reader have found each other. The, and now, the now defunct village voice. Yes, uh, but you know, this, and actually it's very funny because there was a period of time when libraries were so much the crossroad of society that people would leave notes in books uh, in hopes that someone who they had lost connection with would see the notes and somehow reconnect that way. And it seemed so, first of all, futile, but so hopeful that the one that I found which said, you know, Jenny, I've looked for you everywhere. I'm leaving you notes in every book because I know you like libraries. Call me at the old number. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but um, that that this is a crossroads of society, that that idea that anyone can come in and anyone might find something they're interested in or a person that they had lost felt wonderful. I could continue on that. I mean... On that on that path, there's so much to be to be said, and it, it's actually quite moving. Um, when I saw that that note, um, no, I th I think it really did move me. This idea that 
you might find what you were looking for in the library. And you might find it in the library because someone may be reading the same books as you do, which in, in a sense is in part what we crave for, is people who read the same books we do. And the, the fact that someone took the trouble to write a book on some very specific subject that happens to be the thing you are interested in. And then the question becomes, if that book, which is so ex esoteric, is not checked out often enough, is it the responsibility of the library to hold on to it? And well, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a big issue. Um, weeding, as most librarians will tell you, is... Um, Wonderful euphemism. I know. And I saw the weeded books one day, and it, it's a little heartbreaking, but one of them, for instance, was Billy Carter's autobiography. <laughs> and I thought, maybe that's not getting as much traffic as, <laughs> <laughs> as the Da Vinci Code. Maybe that... Um, and what does that say? Well, I think it makes me look at humanity with a more generous <laughs> spirit. <laughs> But libraries don't have unlimited space, and I know that it's controversial it when they con get rid of books. And but I showed you, I showed you that incredible card catalog that a, a librarian just before retirement put together. It's of amazing. Thousands of index cards. I don't know for those of you who don't know it. In the reading room, you should all go and look at sixty volumes of card catalogs. Um, uh, Xerox of all the cards that no longer exist. I don't know if you know Nicholson Baker's incredible essay called mm -hmm. Discarded. All the cards that have disappeared and the knowledge that those cards included. Now we can wax terribly nostalgic, I understand that. Right. But something is gained, but certainly something is lost. And I think that we, the idea that a book that's unpopular might truly disappear from the face of the earth. There, there's something disturbing about that. Even if it is Billy Carter's autobiography, you, you feel Who are you somewhere to say? it should, it should it still exist. That yeah. if there is a, a reason, it's, it, it's the product of someone's mind and somebody calling out into the wilderness and you and, want and books to we feel find and maybe books we find despicable you know books of horrible propaganda um, but i think but that they, they should it's uh, an important artifact of human thought and history um the problem is libraries don't have unlimited space so it, and maybe we'll move toward a future where uh, Billy Carter's autobiography will be digitized and then the physical book let will... Us, let us hope. But yeah. be, be, be before that time, um, as we slowly widen down, Poor but Billy not quite Carter. yet because there's still things to talk about, we must talk about the arsonist. Yes. Um, you must paint a picture of him. Harry. A young man named Harry Peake, who was in his 20s, he had grown up in a small town outside of Los Angeles, which in, in terms of its kind of culture could have been a million miles away. It, it, it was an exurb that had no connection to Los Angeles. He was a good-looking, charming, um, good-natured, aspirational young man who, not surprisingly, given that he lived near LA, decided he wanted to, he, yeah. he would be a movie star. And I, I, in the past, said he wanted to be an actor, and then I realized that that's not quite accurate. I think he really wanted to be a movie star as distinct from being an actor. So he moved to LA, was doing a lot of odd jobs. Um, he was also, an incredible fabulist and That's liar. Right. Um, I was wondering if fabulist would be the word for liar. I think yeah. he, he had a way of, uh, the reason I love saying he's a fabulist is that 
his lies were almost always fabulous. There was always uh, his friends would say, uh, where did you go for lunch? And he would say, oh, I had lunch with Cher. Or I was just uh, had coffee with Burt Reynolds. He was, uh, he'd make up these stories that were patently false. He drove everyone crazy, but at the same time, he was a really likable guy, kind of harmless. Well, besides saying he was having lunch with Cher and coffee with Burt Reynolds, he began telling people he had set the library on fire. Not such a fabulous story to tell when the entire arson investigative department is trying to figure out who set the fire. So he was arrested after he told many friends that he had started the fire and was arrested um, on a probable cause warrant. And I won't give too much of the no, story you, away, you, you, but yeah. it, it, it ended up taking many odd turns. Um, and I think, I think you shouldn't say very much more because it, it, it there is that element in the book where you, you want to know more. You want to know more about him and his past is extraordinary. His family is extraordinary. And his, his sister he's is. He's very much um, in many ways. He's your kind of guy. He is. <laughs> well, within a no. certain range of my life. He, no, I, I wouldn't say he's like thoroughly my kind of guy. No, I didn't mean. <laughs> I, no, but, but he's, he's attractive. Kind of he's attractive yes. to you. Yes. I, I don't mean it quite the way it could sound. Well, I'm, but I'm fascinated by people who... Who are broken. Who, and, and who who are broken and who invent a, a, a scenario for themselves that's much grander than their life. It's It fascinates me. And he was absolutely in that category of somebody who whose own life felt too small and disappointing. Well, you know, about John LaRoche, you, you wrote s many things he said were incredible or staggering or cracked or improbable, but they were never boring. The current of his mind and behavior was more riptide than rivulet. I didn't care all that much whether what he said was true or not. I just found the flow irresistible. And there's a parallel. Let's look at video number two, if we could. My leg hurts. I wonder if it's cancer. There's a bump. I'm starting to sweat. Stop sweating. I've got to stop sweating. Can she see it dripping down my forehead? Oh, she looked at my hairline. She thinks I'm bald. She Can you hear? Great. Oh, wow. Thanks. That's, that's nice to hear. We all just... Loved the Malkovich script. Thanks. Such Thanks. a unique voice. Boy, I'd love to find a, a portal into your brain. <laughs> Trust me, it's no fun. <laughs> so, tell me your thoughts on this crazy little project of ours. First, I think it's a great book. LaRoche is a fun character, isn't it? Absolutely. And Orlean makes orchids so fascinating. Plus her, her musings <laughs> on Florida and orchid poaching, Indians, it's just, it's great sprawling New Yorker stuff. And I'd want to remain true to that, you know, I'd, I'd want to let the uh, movie exist rather, rather than be artificially plot driven. Great. I guess I'm not exactly sure what that means. Oh. I'm not sure I know what that means <laughs> either. Uh, yeah, I just don't want to <laughs> ruin it by making it a Hollywood thing, you know, like 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 an orchid heist movie or or something, you know, or uh, you know, changing the orchids into poppies and turning it into a movie about drug running, you know. Definitely. Why, why can't there be a movie simply about, about flowers? I guess we thought that maybe Susan Orlean and 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 Laroche could fall in love. Okay. And but I'm saying it, it's like I don't want to cram in sex or uh, guns or <laughs> car chases. You know, I, I, or characters, you, you know, learning profound life lessons, or growing, or coming to like each other, or overcoming obstacles to succeed in the end. You know, <laughs> it's it's the, the book isn't like that, and and life isn't like that. You know, it just isn't. And 
And I, f I feel very strongly about this. <laughs> I think that's the one time that I felt truly understood as a writer. Well, you, well, you know, you, you, you have this incredible line when you say, when I wrote The Orchid's Thief, I certainly didn't think I was writing a meditation on loneliness and obsession. And actually, that was one of the fascinating things about seeing the movie, discovering things about the book that I hadn't realized were there. Is that what you meant? Absolutely. A in fact, it was, um, and that's why when people say to me, uh, well, I've had some people say, how did you let them do that to your book? And, which is one of my favorite strange comments. But um, I feel like the movie saw something that I wasn't even aware of as I was writing it. And kind of tease that out of the story. And it was a revelation for me, frankly. I think often when you're writing, you're not even sure what it is that the, the subconscious message that is coming through. And I, what, the, uh, what the idea is, but also what the idea behind the idea is. Exactly, and I think it takes somebody, another person often to, to see that. And it was actually in some ways, um, slightly unnerving to to first read the script and think, was that on the page or was, how did they know that? Or was I unmasked? Yeah, and I think that there was uh, a lot of that unmasking that was fascinating. There isn't too much time left, but there are a few minutes left. Um, I don't have the virtue of concision, but I do. I do want to mention Bradbury, because he was so essential in a way to the story. And also it's an, a very moving moment for me because I mentioned Jonathan Demi, and the only one time I had a public occasion with Jonathan Demi. He used to come to a lot of events, particularly um, when Edwidge Danticat came here because mm. he was very close to her and had m did an incredible movie about Haiti, which is a place that m means a lot to me as well. But he once interviewed me at the Byrne Theatre mm. on Fahrenheit 451, but the movie, the, the Truffaut movie that is wacko and wonderful and yes. strange <laughs> and a lot of people don't like it, and I love it. And um, Ray Bradbury says the following, and you can comment on it, and certainly you have in the book. My first version of what would become Fahrenheit 451 was finished, but first I had to find a place to write it. I had a newborn child at home, and the house was loud with her cries and exultation at being alive. I had no money for an office, for while wandering around UCLA, I heard typing from the basement of Powell Library. I went to investigate and found a room with 12 typewriters that could be rented for 10 cents per half hour. So exhilarated, I got a bag of dimes and settled into the room, and in nine days, I spent $9.80 and wrote my story. In other words, it was a dime novel. The wonderful thing, <laughs> the wonderful thing about writing F Fahrenheit 451, which I called the fireman the first time out, was the fact that I could run up and down the stairs in the library and seize books on, off the shelf, not knowing what I was going to find next, opening the book and discovering quotes to rush back down the typing room to insert it into my <laughs> novel. It was a passionate and exciting time for me. Imagine what it was like to be writing a book about book burning and doing it in a library with a passion of all those authors, living and dead, surrounded me. And that's why I, I, I love everything about that quote. And Bradbury didn't go to college and instead spent 13 years tr reading his way through the Los Angeles Public Library. And he was an enormous devotee of that library and believed it. He would refer to it as his, his education, his, the place where he kind of his came university. alive. Yes, and I wrote some of this book in the library. Well, first I was renting a co-working space, and then one day I was in the library, and I thought, why am I spending all that money on the co-working space? Which it's has ridiculous. become highly fashionable. And, but 
the library was much better. Um, but it seemed important to spend a certain amount of time writing this book in a library and, and feeling and smelling the library and hearing it and experiencing it as a place that I would be day after day. And that you would giving back to. You would be giving back to the library what it gave you, right? You would be giving them back this very beautiful and get it red book. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you for that. No, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, and, and it was also why I wanted to call it the library book and just be very simple with the name because... Because that's it what it is. Yeah. Um, two, th two last things. Three last things. Um, four last things. Um, a question from Elizabeth Gilbert. How do you choose? I have a vision of your mind as this massive cabinet of curiosities with interest and excitement stretching in all directions. I sense that there is hardly anything you're not curious about. So how do you choose which strand of fascination to pursue? It's, uh, that description of my mind is probably pretty accurate. And every now and again, as I'm writing, I stop and step back and think, how did I end up with this idea when, when I had a hundred other ideas? Why this story? So so. How I did think this happen? it's when I have an idea that sticks and then it, another uh, sort of emotional piece of it comes in and then there's a factual piece of it and it just keeps growing and growing and I can't shake it off. It's the one idea. I mean, in the course of a week, I might have... I mean, I have to admit, I just find everything kind of interesting and and the more interests you have the more interesting you are well i'd like to think so <laughs> i mean it, uh, when when the more appetites well one i'm has. good at a dinner party because i have i have written about That's good to so know. many <laughs> so many different things now that when people will say, you know, I once saw a donkey, and I'll go, well, do I wrote about donkeys in Morocco. How funny you should mention that. And, or, you know, I really like taxidermy. No, say more. I've written about taxidermy. I can talk to you about taxidermy. And why one lands and why I pursue it is often, in the case of this, it was this persistent emotional feeling about libraries. Because it wasn't the remove you had from the orchid thief. Right. It, I mean, it was actually um, the, the, the folly of contiguity in some way. You were very close to this subject. This was uh, very personal yeah, in that way. And still feeling like, I don't know, I don't know. And then when the story of the fire connected, it felt this is my story. Destined to be written about. Um, probably my great frustration is there's so many... St I, I just don't have enough time and energy to write all the stories that I want to write. There are just too many. And What a great feeling to have. Oh, it is It is. What a great, great feeling to have. Um, I'm going to be interviewing John McPhee in, in, in a short while. Um, I know he... Mm. Yeah. So what should I ask him? If he'll call me. <laughs> um, your, your mother wanted to be a librarian. Um, you mentioned that earlier on. And in a way, when, when you and I had our, I have this podcast called A Phone Call from Paul, where I call people I love or admire, or in, in some cases both. And I, I said this book, in a, in a way, was, was written for your mother. Yes, it, it really was. And the fact that the experience I was having with her while writing this book was of her losing her memory resonated so much with the notion of libraries being the place where our memories can live forever. And that, that made it so poignant and um, kind of heartbreaking but also heartening at the same time because she passed away about midway 
through working on the book, but the time leading up to it, she had lost not only the memories of the time we spent together, but eventually didn't really remember me. And I had to believe that I was putting down on paper something that made those memories feel that they could last. You know, the, the, the word remembering is so strong in English, I find. It really means putting the members back together mm. as if in a whole. Um, That's it's so powerful. Yeah, and it's, um, it's a, a very, to me, the libraries are remembering for a whole culture. And so having the sort of macro and micro of those two ideas of memory, to think about my mother and try to commit to paper a lot of my memories of being with her and realizing that that's what books do for all of us is to preserve a memory. I want you in closing to read the last page of your book. Um, so it's on, on page 309. You will all have the pleasure of reading it this evening. Um, <laughs> from, p uh, from the beginning, I went to the very end. I went to the library late one day, just before closing time, when the light outside was already dusky and the place was sleepy and slow. The library is so big that when the crowds thin out, it can feel very private, almost like a secret place. And the space is so enveloping that you have no sense of the world outside. I went down to the history department and then roam from department to department, just strolling through and cross the beautiful hollow rotunda, a gorgeous surprise every time I entered it, and then went up the wide lap of the back staircase where the statue of civilization stared at me as I made my way. The silence was more soothing than solemn. A library is a good place to soften solitude, a place where you can feel part of a conversation that has gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years, even when you're all alone. The library is a whispering post. You don't need to take a book off a shelf to know there is a voice inside that is waiting to speak to you. And behind that was someone who truly believed that if he or she spoke, someone would listen. It was that affirmation that always amazed me. Even the oddest, most particular book was written with that kind of courage, the writer's belief that someone would find his or her book important to read. I was struck by how precious and foolish and brave that belief is, and how necessary and how full of hope it is to collect these books and manuscripts and preserve them. It declares that all these stories matter, and so does every effort to create something that connects us to one another and to our past and to what is still to come. I realized that this entire time learning about the library, I had been convincing myself that my hope to tell a long-lasting story, to create something that endured, to be alive somehow as long as someone would read my books, was what drove me on, story after story. It was my lifeline, my passion, my way to understand who I was. I thought about my mother, who died when I was halfway done with this book, and I knew how pleased she would have been to see me in the library, and I was able to use that thought to transport myself for a split second to a time when I was young and she was in the moment, alert and tender, with years ahead of her and she was beaming at me as I toddled to the checkout counter with an armload of books. I knew if, that if we had come here together to this enchanted place with statues and with stucco and statuary and all the stories in the world for us to have, she would have reminded me just about now that if she could have chosen any profession in the world, she would have been a librarian. I looked around the room at the few people scattered here and there. Some were leaning into books and a few were just resting, having a private moment in a public place. And I felt buoyed by being here. 
This is why I wanted to write this book to tell about a place I love that doesn't belong to me, but feels like it is mine, and how that feels marvelous and exceptional. All the things that are wrong in the world seem conquered by a library's simple, unspoken promise. Here I am, please tell me your story. Here's my story, please listen. The security guards began arranging chairs and straightening tables while calling out, Four minutes, four minutes to closing. The few of us here snapped our books shut and swept our belongings together and headed upstairs. In the checkout line, a heavyset man with three books under his arm began a jiggling, hip-wagging dance, and people stepped around him carefully on their way out the door. Thank you very much. <laughs>